Good, I just want to introduce myself and, and welcome you to Regis Technologies. I'm Lewis Glenz, president of Regis, and uh, this is the second of a series of talks we want to have. The first one was in April and it was on CMC and DMF. Um, it's now on YouTube, and actually there's some DVDs of that back there, so if you want, you can grab a DVD, and if we're out, just let us know, we'll, we'll get you a copy of that DVD. Um, we're also planning one for November, and Paul Rezel, who's back there in the blue shirt, Dr. Paul Rezel, is our head of AMD, and he's going to give a seminar on November 8th titled Analytical Method <laughs> Strategies for Drug Development. So, looking forward to that. Can um, I sign up already? What's that? Can I sign up already? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, exactly. We'll get number one signed up. Um, so, I have the pleasure of introducing Mike Annisfeld. If you see Mike's bio, it's quite extensive, so I just grabbed about five little items out of it. And I uh, wanted to say that Mike you know, works the globe uh, supporting companies in, in the pharmaceutical industry as well as regulatory agencies such as FDA and in Australia, the TGA. And they drive business too. Um, every year, Mike does about 25 mock inspections. And in fact, for both our PAI inspections, Mike did mock inspections going over our documentation. And we, we passed both with flying colors, so it was a, a good investment. Uh, Mike's the author of many books on quality. And uh, he's supported Regis for about 10 years now. And with support, Mike comes out for training, uh, mock audits, and also replies to email questions. And he replies at all hours of the night because Mike might be traveling in Europe or it's Asia. It's not the night for me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was going to tell one sort of fun story. Um, we were audited by FDA Sue Brutally, which was known as a very tough auditor, like a very, very well-known auditor. But at the end of the audit, she had to close out. And then she made a few suggestions, and we told her we're working with Mike Annisfeld, and she said, that's a very good choice. All my people do very well when they work with Mike Annisfeld. So let's welcome Mike up. Thank you very much, Louis. <laughs> I've never understood why people clap when you first come and don't do it at the end. <laughs> I would wait till the end. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Annisfeld. I'm very pleased to be here. If anybody is celebrating Sukkot, Chag Sameach, um, we're going to be talking about global trends in APIs and uh, drug product GMPs, and I'm going to make a few predictions of where things are going. Um, so the schedule today, um, in one hour, we're going to fit in quite a lot of things. Um, global finished drug product GMPs, what, what are they, where are they in the world? We're going to talk about key drivers of GMPs, which is going to give some predictions for the future. And we're going to talk about the influence of PICS. If you don't know what PICS is, you will in a few minutes. Then we're going to get into uh, global GMPs for APIs and the influence of ICH. If you're not sure what ICH is, you will in a few minutes. We're going to talk about GMPs for excipients. And then we're going to get into just a summary of global trends and predictions. Am I loud enough for Mr. Videographer? Yeah. We're okay. All right. Um, just my background, Lewis gave it to you. I spent a lot of time training inspectors in government agencies around the world on how to do inspections. So if they give you some real hard time, blame me. Um, I work on both sides of the fence, both for clients overseas and in the USA, and with uh, inspectors, so I see both sides of the field. So I think I'm in a position to give you some hints and ideas of where things are going. Um, let's get into uh, finished drug product GMPs worldwide, and then because that historically was the first GMPs, and then we'll get into API GMPs and excipient GMPs. Am I blocking your screen view? Okay. Um, you have all the slides I have here except for two which I added this morning because I always go through very nervously at five in the morning and uh, you know I should have said this so I just added a couple. So if you want this entire presentation uh, give me a card I can send it to you on an email or wait for Lewis and his DVDs and his YouTubes. All right, GMPs are effect in 104 countries worldwide including such major pharmaceutical centers of excellence such as CHAD. You've heard of CHAD? little country in Africa with zero pharmaceutical industry. Why they have GMPs, I have no idea, but they do. Uh, the principles of GMPs are the same wherever you go. Documentation, validation, error correction, etc. The principles are the same. But you need to be aware that there are nuanced differences between different countries. For example, if you make an error in your batch record or your lab notebooks, you all know the way to fix that, right? Anybody know how to fix an error in a lab notebook? Anybody care to help me out? <laughs> Actually, wrong. It's not line through, initial and write, uh, whatever. It's one line through, write the correct answer, initial it and date it, and in some countries also give the reason. So Australia wants the reason. Most companies want it, but it's not a GMP in most of the world. 
EU, it can be initials instead of signature, that's fine. In Japan, and we've had been caught out with a couple of American companies I work with, when the Japanese inspectors came over, it's not one line through, it's two lines through, and they have to be in parallel, not an X. Why? Because in Japan, when you put one line through a word, it means you've now written the negative of that word. So it says, go do, and you put one line through, it means go do not do. So a little bit of trivia for you. And in the USA, we don't care, signatures or initials. So the principle is the same. The, the writing has to be legible. This is absolutely a no-no. And when I order, this is not, a, <laughs> this is not an old picture. And if, you, if, and if you open that door, you'll find four backup bottles. I mean, so, you know, these are the no-nos in the world. Uh, let me talk about the uh, GMPs around the world, a little bit of history, politics, philosophy, geography, uh, just to make life a bit interesting. Anybody know the first GMPs in the world? Who wrote the first GMPs in the world? They apply to the food industry, and the answer is God. If you read the Bible, it's in there about how to kill and prepare food. The first modern day GMPs, King Ludwig of Bavaria, the pure beer laws. How to make beer, how not to contaminate beer. In modern times, drug GMPs, the first is Canada in 1959 as it happens. People, everybody forgets about it. But Canada in 59, I'll come back to that. I mentioned that the uh, GMPs are in effect in 104 countries in the world, and that is the World Health Organization GMPs. Until 1968, everybody here could meet those GMPs by cooking drugs in your kitchen. I mean, they were the lowest common denominator, so everybody in the world could meet it. And then at a big meeting we had, sorry, 1986, and I was part of that meeting, we said, this is not helping anybody, it's time to get tough. So we upgraded the World Health Organization GMPs. Today, I give you a warning, the World Health Organization GMPs, in some respects, are the toughest in the world. You go into the guidelines for water systems, you all know what a dead leg is? Defined as not more than six pipe diameters, correct? You're all knowing that? World Health Organization now wants three pipe diameters. You look in the GMPs for air conditioning systems, again, toughest in the world. World Health Organization GMPs are adopted by all the signatory countries, 104 of them, and they have five to seven years to update their GMPs to reflect WHO. So if you want to keep track of WHO GMPs, it's giving you a five-year lead into where American GMPs are headed. So look for a change in the definition of dead legs and a few other things. It's the official GMP in Russia, China, um, India, so, uh, most Arab countries, most African countries except South Africa, most Latin American countries except Brazil and Argentina. So very wide influence WHO GMPs. You then have the Europeans. Now the Europeans are bizarre and I can say that because I am a European. I'm British and I'm an American, both. <coughs> Europeans tend to go to war every 40 years. I mean, if you go through history, every 40 years, every second generation, there's a war. So in 1870, Germany invades France, loses, end of that war. 40 years later, 1914, Germany invades France, World War I, loses, end of that war. 40 years later, 1940, Germany invades France and other places, uh, ends up with World War II, loses that war. After the war, about 10 years later, and this is, I've read this now story now in several different places, so I assume it's true. The chief economist of, Italy, of France and the chief economist of Germany happen to be being at the same hotel in summertime for vacation. And they're sitting around the pool, and what do you discuss with a colleague around the pool? Both of you economists, you discuss, why are wars happening? Why do people go to war? And their conclusion is, because you have what I want. And so I invade you to get it. And as economists, they said, well, what happens if we linked our economies together such that if you go to war against me, everybody loses? And they thought this was a great idea, and they said, well, let's do that. And that gave you the start of the European Economic Community in 1958. Six countries, the biggies, Germany, France, Italy, the little ones, Holland, Luxembourg, Belgium, got together and said, we are going to share our economies. Free movement of, in, of money, free movement of goods, free movement of labor. Anything can move anywhere. If it's approved in one country, it's automatically approved in the others. So for the drug industry, if France approves a drug, automatically saleable in any of the other five. Great idea, yes? That was the European Economic Community. The thought of GMP never came up to them, all right? 1970s, so that was the club of six. All rolled into the European, it took me hours to get that. <laughs> 
point. Um, six countries. M meanwhile, all the countries around those six and the rest of Europe said, oh my God, they've built a wall around them. We won't be able to trade. So we better set up a competing group. And they set up what's called the European Free Trade Area. The same thing, but with one extra wrinkle. They said, for drugs, we will have GMPs and we will recognize each other's inspections. So if one country has GMPs and inspects, we don't have to go and inspect in the other country. We can, but we don't have to. That was the Pharmaceutical Inspection Convention. All right? So they started sharing inspection reports, started sharing inspector training. Then a bit of a catastrophe happened because the European club in the middle there was so <coughs> successful economically, all these countries started joining them. So they all joined them. And now EFTA is left with basically three countries. It's nothing. But when these countries joined the European economic community, they said, OK, where are your GMPs, Europe? And Europe says, we don't have them. And so they said, well, we do. So Europe said, fine, we'll adopt yours. So the PICS GMPs, Pharmaceutical Inspection Convention GMPs, became, except for two words, the European Union GMPs. So Europe and the PICS group have the same GMPs. The two words that are different is qualified person. In America, we don't have that concept. In European law, only one person in the company called the qualified person can release product to market. That person has to be a pharmacist and has a lot of training. There's one in this room that I know of, and that's me. Um, I don't think anybody else here was born and raised in Europe. You have to be born in Europe and go to a European university to become a QP if you're a pharmacist. The rest of you, sorry, doesn't work. So Europe is now 28 countries. Wonderful stuff. Meanwhile, other countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Argentina, South Africa, all said this idea of sharing inspection reports, training people to work at one standard is a great idea. It can save us a lot of money, a lot of travel. Why don't we share inspection reports? And so now we have PICS, Pharmaceutical Inspection Cooperation Scheme, which is now 38 countries, 12 more want to join, plus the major international groups, WHO, UNICEF, EMEA, and EDQM. WHO does inspections. UNICEF does inspections. I've done a lot of them for them. There are other UN agencies that are heavy into the API and drug business because they buy drugs and give it away, basically, to third world countries who need them. So they're all into this GMP world. All right. Now, I mentioned a lot of other countries, Japan, Korea, um, Philippines, um, Mexico, are all wanting to join PICS. So we're going to end up in about three or four or five years' time with about 60 countries having one GMP code, one GMP inspection methodology, and trusting each other's inspection reports. FDA was forced into doing it by Congress, who said, we can't afford you to keep, keep going all over the world. FDA has joined PICS, but it doesn't really take part in the sharing of inspection reports yet. That is coming. Ultimately, what's going to be coming is that all the inspections will be done by the PICS groups. If, if South Africa did a company in South Africa, FDA is not going to bother going, because they'll trust the South African inspectors. ASEAN, group of Southeast Asian nations, wants to set up a common market like the Europeans do to trade goods. They're trying to write GMPs as out of the 10 countries, six belong to PICS. Have a guess what their GMP is going to read like. I mean, it's a no-brainer. Same thing in, um, come back to that. Same thing in South America, Mercosur, South American common market. They have one overriding philosophy in their GMPs that you don't know about here, and that's a term called manana. You know manana? It'll come someday. They've been working on joint GMPs for 30 years, yet to happen. The biggest influence on GMP in the last 20 years has been ICH, International Conference on Harmonization, that is harmonizing many, many aspects of drug registration so that you don't have to do things three times. 20 years ago, if you wanted to register a drug in Japan or Europe or America, you had three different stability studies with three different temperatures, humid humidity conditions. Everybody said, the regulators and industry, this is nuts. Let's have one system. And so they've harmonized aspects of stability studies. If you follow ICHQ1, you will be OK everywhere worldwide. If you follow ICHQ2 on validation of analytical methods, then you'll be fine worldwide. And now ICH came out with GMPs for active pharmaceutical ingredients, APIs. So the American guideline on APIs is identical to the American guideline on GMPs for APIs in Europe, which is identical to the one in Japan. It's one harmonized API GMP, courtesy of ICH. 
The biggest impact of ICH has changed the whole way of we doing inspections because the ICH came up with the concept of risk management. ICH came up with the concept of quality by design. ICH came up with the concept of management responsibilities. And ICH has now come up with the concept of quality by design for APIs. So ICH is a big driver in GMP um, concepts. PIX is the big driver in the concept of how to do a proper inspection. Okay. The big unknown in all of this is India, because India is a huge exporter of, pharma of pharmaceuticals and an even bigger exporter of APIs. In Europe, 80% of all APIs come from India. India doesn't belong to anybody, any organization. It's not ICH, it's not PICS, and it's there by itself. And the GMPs in India come from 1963, known as Schedule Schedule M. And they have some bizarre things. You cannot put an expiration date on a finished product in India that is longer than the expiration date on any of the APIs you use. So if your API only has six months left to go, you can't put a six, more than a six month expiration date on the finished product. It's a bit nuts. Scientifically, it doesn't hold up, but that's the law in India. So be aware there are some strange things in the world. So where is India going? I'll tell you in a moment. And then, of course, there are bilateral agreements between countries. The United States officially never inspects in Switzerland. Switzerland is neutral, doesn't allow any foreign inspections of anybody. So how does FDA inspect Roche and all the other big companies in Switzerland? It's a little bit of a hokey thing here. The inspection is officially a Swiss inspection with a Swiss inspector. The FDA is an observer who happens to ask 99% of the questions. That's, that's how they get around that one. Uh, let's just talk about the BRICS. Am I going too fast? BRICS is the acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Uh, let's talk about Brazil. They have already applied to join PICS, so they're on the way to joining the world. Uh, they only really export to South American countries. Russia intends to apply to PICS and intends to implement GMPs by, nine, by 2014 with a huge but, because I've been to Russia several times for the Ministry of Health. Number one, their legislation doesn't recognize the concept of GMP. So you don't have to meet it legally in Russia. Number two, their GMP code doesn't exist. They've cobbled together bits of America, bits of Europe, bits of their own stuff, and it's a bizarre Russian agglomeration. And nobody follows them. And they only have one inspector in the whole of Russia, because that's all the budget, and she doesn't have a travel budget, so she is stuck in an office in Moscow. Um, Russia is a tragedy from a GMP perspective and a drug quality perspective. 80% of all the drugs sold in Russia are actually imported because even the Russians don't want their own stuff. Uh, I was with the Mongolian Health Authority and they were telling me their biggest source of problems in Mongolia is fraudulent drugs of which 99% comes from Russia. That's telling you the Russian situation. India, uh, there's no industry or government consensus on joining anybody like ICH or PICS. They're thinking about it, that's all I can tell you. Uh, one of the biggest problems in India is a bureaucratic Indian government problem. The only people allowed to travel overseas who are members of the Indian government are very high director level and above. But PIX works on the basis of having joint inspections of everybody at a lower level. So just from the bureaucracy, they would have to change the bureaucracy in India. China intends to join PIX in 2014, but they keep pushing that date off year by year by year. Uh, I do annual training of the Chinese inspection force and they tell me the following. They need inspector training. In China, inspections of sterile products are done on a national basis out of their Beijing office, but anything other dosage form, tablets, creams, is done on the local basis. The local inspection agency does it, and there is no consistency in GMP application there at all. There's no consistency in training, and at the local level, there is no such thing as a full-time GMP inspector. They're part-time academics, part-time hospital administrators, part-time senior army officials, or senior Communist Party officials whose knowledge of GMPs and drugs is zip. Uh, I don't want to say anything bad about the Chinese Inspection Authority, but the senior inspectors in many provinces tell me what the letters GMP really stand for. You think it stands for, GMP stands for? Good Manufacturing Practices. As far as they're concerned, it's an acronym for Give Money, Pass. Corruption is endemic in, in China. It is a huge problem. They're dealing with it. If they wanted to join PICS or anybody else, they would have to really shape up. Uh, an inspection certificate from a Chinese inspection agency, frankly, is not worth the paper it's printed on. And you can estimate the value of the paper at about three cents a sheet. Really, it's, it's just not. South Africa is a full member of PICS. They're the first in Africa. Uh, I was just there recently, three weeks ago, giving a training course to their inspection agency. They will become good. 
They are bright people, they know what they're doing, and they're very concerned about the quality of drugs, especially the quality of drugs coming from India, and they're now also beginning to have an international inspection program. Um, this is a subjective thing that people always ask me, who is the toughest inspection agency? Um, I would say this is purely subjective based on lots of colleagues in the, in the industry in many countries, inspectors I know all over the world. Um, the United States and the United Kingdom are reckoned to be the toughest inspection agencies. Uh, the U.S., because the U.S. is a regulation, you must do it. So if they come and see you and you only have one person doing weighing, they very simply say, well, what part of two don't you understand? Because GMP say you have to have two people when you're weighing. So it's very cut and dried with the Americans. There's no room to discuss or to argue. Uh, plus, the Americans have never worked in industry. They don't know the reality of what's good and what's bad and what's logical. The British are the toughest from another perspective. To become an inspector in Britain, you have to have 20 years' experience working in the industry, 10 years of which is at a managerial level. The salary in the British in inspectorate is equivalent to industry after about 25 years. So many people in industry see working for the British MHRA as the capstone of their career and a way to give back. So when they come in, it's like the poacher turned gamekeeper. They know where your skeletons are and they know where you've probably hid it because they've been hiding it for 20 years. So the inspections are much tougher. Uh, Benvenue Labs, I'll mention company names where it's in the public domain, were totally shocked out of their mind when the British came two years ago and shut them down. But they said, the FDA keeps coming here and we got no problems. And the, FDA, and the British said, that's FDA, we're the British. So be aware, the British can be much, much tougher than the FDA and usually are. Uh, Australia, Brazil, Canada, uh, very tough, very experienced people. The Brazilians, uh, be, a, be, be afraid. Uh, 20 years ago, the Brazilian agency was accused by the government of not doing their job because they allowed a horrible tragedy to happen in Brazil. The government shut down the entire agency, started up again, invited FDA to come in and establish it, train them, etc. And Visa are really good inspectors. They know what they're doing. Um, Northern European countries, Japan, okay, not bad. Southern European, I'm convinced the quality of wine at lunch has a lot to do with whether you pass. And there's a new group out there of doing inspections all over the world. Uh, China is doing inspections all over the world, I think out of revenge. They're sick and tired of everybody coming and slamming them, so they're going overseas now to slam other people. Uh, Ghana, Uruguay, and South Africa are not really concerned with GMP compliance. What they're concerned with is counterfeiting. They want to go and see the place that is supposedly where they make the drug. If they get there and they exist, that's 90% of the inspection over. And you'd be amazed, my South African colleagues tell me, of how many places they go to where the company doesn't exist. They have started the concept that when you register a drug, you also have to give the GPS coordinates of the facility. And that's helped them tremendously. And FDA has also now picked up on that. And officially, pretty soon, they'll start asking for GPS coordinates of all your facilities, especially overseas Chinese Indian <coughs> facilities. So that's coming up too. And then when you have the coordinates, you can look on Google Maps and see if it actually, oh, it's, an open, it's a river. I mean, where's the factory? <laughs> 